He shares his insights often in his Forbes column, Inc. Magazine, and a variety of other top-tier publications. Like I said earlier, John's talking today about using digital content to build trust and influence decision makers. You see it with John's company and his own brand. Uh, the content marketing that they put out really makes them thought leaders and positions others as thought leaders. So with that, John. Hello, Mike Workin. You guys hear me fine? All right, uh, before I get started, uh, give Chris and John and all these guys a round of applause. I mean, putting together a conference like this is challenging, so thanks for the hard work, guys. Where Do we have a clicker somewhere? Okay, we'll just shoot until I get the clicker here. Um, really, uh, as, as John said, my name is John Hall, I'm the CEO of Influence & Co. Where my background lies is specifically in, getting, in, in working with companies to get content coming from them to reach a specific audience. So when Chris asked me to speak, uh, one of the big things that we try to do is naturally build influence uh, within certain audiences coming from a company. So that's what I'm going to be covering today to basically influence decision makers. Um, do we have the clicker? I think maybe David talking about it. Let me check with him. All right. Can we manually do one then? We'll just go with it. All right, well, anyway, that's actually the wrong one. Let's just go by memory. So it's, it's, to start out, before we get started, let's, let's actually get the uh, definition of influence. Does anybody have it right now? And before you guys shout your issue, before you guys all shout, um, really when it comes down to it, I want to have some house rules to start out this uh, presentation by saying, one, um, when it comes to engagement. I want to reward you guys for engaging in this presentation. So if you guys raise your hand and you answer a question um, or interact with me, I'm going to throw a little basketball here, come up to me afterwards, and I will find something that's valuable, whether it's a gift card or something. I'll make sure that you guys get rewarded for engaging. Uh, the second house rule, there's actually some really funny pictures that we're missing here. Does anybody No. I promise I'm really funny outside of this, but this is very challenging. But uh, second house rule is, uh, is basically let's keep things real. A lot of times I'm in your guys' position and I'm listening to a speaker and I actually feel like, oh, I already know that. Or I'm actually, um, you know, this is something my company already does. Um, I'm, I'm here for you guys. I'm not here for myself. Speaking scares the shit out of me. It actually does. I get really nervous. I'm here to be a resource for you. So come up to me afterwards if you have a question that specifically is uh, actually addressing a need that you guys have, and we can actually have a real conversation. But uh, be open to learning uh, through this. And then, man, this is really challenging right now. <laughs> but my laptop's back there. Like, all right, you want to go? No, slash, slash, like. Hey, can you manually do it back with the audio visual? <laughs> you got to be absolutely kidding me. All right, we're going to specific. This is the first time I've run through this speech, by the way. And uh, so let's just go by memory. OK, so when it comes to building your influence, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, specifically today, what I want to get across is how you can get actual digital content, online content, in front, of an, in front of an audience to influence. And to, to do this right, you have to basically do it in three different tiers. There's the strategy of it, which in this phase, I want you guys to think about questions. Too often, when you're thinking strategically about something, you say, this is what I think we should do, and you don't ask the right questions. So ask yourself, what type of content should you be getting out there? From who? Why? What actions do you want that influencer to make? What do you want them to do after they read your content? Like, really think through that before you even move on to anything else. It's too often somebody throws up a blog or writes an article and doesn't actually think what they want to get out of that article. And so ask yourself those questions. Uh, the next step is content creation. When it comes to content creation, there's a lot, it's, it's a crap load of time that goes into it. So a lot of times uh, people say, should I be ghostwriting? Should we be hiring this out? Um, yes. Writers are fantastic. Content developers are fantastic. However, if you're not engaged in the content creation process, if you're not truly getting your expertise into it, the personal stories, you're going to miss out a lot of value. The first being, the, the content's actually shittier. It's not as good. When you think about somebody writing, writing about something, if they don't actually have personal experiences to go in that, or expertise, or something that can actually the, the reader can relate to, you're not going to actually engage with them. You're not going to be authentic. And then at the same time, when you're creating content, you want to actually be involved just because it's one of the best ways to become a better leader. 
One of the big things with me is somebody asked me, how are you a, uh, or do you have a business coach? And I said, no, my writing and my account strategist is my business coach. Because when I'm actually thinking about engaging in the content that our company creates, I'm actually thinking, wow, what new trends should I be thinking about? What, it, what are best practices? What are our competitors doing? It gets me to naturally think about what content our company should be getting out there. And so those are two things that you'll miss if you're just only ghostwriting. You're not involved in the process. Um, and then last, it's distribution. When it comes with, to distribution, it's starting to be the king. Everybody has heard an article, or an article out there, or seen an article that says content is king. Everybody has seen that. I wrote probably five of them, so I'm guilty of it too. Um, it's one of those things where distribution is starting to be the king at the same time. So when you, when you think about content that you're reading, it's a very noisy land out there on, on the internet. There's a lot of content that's similar, so you've got to find a way to distribute. Um, we had a client come up to us the other day that said, I want to be on the cover of the Wall Street Journal as, as a guest contributor. I go, you've got to be fucking kidding me. Like, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You're targeting moms at home, and you want to be in the Wall Street Journal. One, they don't even involve guest contributions on the front cover of the Wall Street Journal, and that's your expectation. And so think about who you're trying to get in front of. We had a large company the other day come to us and say, we want to reach 100,000 of our employees. We want to actually engage with them. We want to get content coming from the leaders to this specific audience. So when you think about that, I mean, that's, that's a great audience. 100,000 employees is valuable. And so they're more concerned about where the audience is, where they are publishing, and not just concerned about, OK, it's going in a media outlet. It's going in the Forbes. It's going in the Wall Street Journal. So think about where your audience is when it comes to distribution. Do we have this fixed yet? Any audio visual? OK, cool. This is really challenging because a lot of things I point to. And so uh, let's keep going with this. I'm going to switch around. So uh, one of the best, like a lot of you guys won't realize how content marketing is, a, is playing in your everyday life. Uh, something, who's married here? Jesus, that's a lot of married people. Um, really what's amazing about uh, my, my marriage is my wife is the best content marketer. And she does, did it work? Man, this is, I'm a happy person right now. You're going to realize this. Let's see funny pictures. Like, look at house rules, reward for engagement. I love this. Santa Claus, Tombstone, everybody's seen this? <laughs> Shit, it would have been a lot funnier back then, right? All right, what is influence? Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Actually, I was almost on track here. OK, now we're to, let's jump, well, let's finish the story about my wife. So my wife is one of the best content marketers out there. She actually, she wants to get me to, to cook more. And she used content marketing and she didn't even know it. So what she did was um, she basically uh, sent me an article coming from Plated's blog that was about five essential tools that you should be um, using in your kitchen. And so what I ended up doing is I read the article and I go, wow, I was like, this is really valuable. I was like, I can use this. So then I started checking out Plated. Does anybody know what Plated does? It's pretty amazing. Like I started reading, I was like, you can actually have the portion meal sent to you at work. I can bring it home. I can start cooking. My wife shows up. I'm cooking, and it looks like I'm a damn chef. And she has no idea. Plated is in the gar garbage. I'm not volunteering it. But she's been coming home thinking I'm just the best chef ever. That's, that's an awesome marriage trick, if you guys know it. But she used, if you look at that, look at the natural process of content marketing there. Plated got content in front of my wife, in front of me, I naturally trusted them, learned more, educated myself, and now I'm a brand advocate speaking about how amazing uh, what they did was. Does that make sense? Are you seeing how this is happening in everyday life, how you're naturally being educated and you're going and buying things based on that? Okay. And so what I want you guys to do, going back to the strategy of things, uh, really create your own roadmap. Create how a, a decision maker actually goes through your process and actually um, say, okay, where, once they meet me, or once they see my product, what's the next thing they're going to? So here's a good example of last week I spoke in San Francisco. And uh, I asked one of the, the clients that came from that, I said, what did you do after you saw me speak? He said, I searched you online. I go, okay, great. So I, this is starting that dis decision maker's uh, roadmap. So I said, okay, you saw me online. Was it easy to find me? He said, yes. If you're not easily found, you should be. 
people like me have an attention span of like 10 seconds. So if I'm searching for you and I see a butterfly across my screen, I'm gonna go follow the butter butterfly. And a lot of decision makers are like that. So make yourself easily found. Brand yourself is one for social media that you guys can use where all your social media sites will show up if you guys aren't familiar with it. Um, but then you think about what, once somebody finds you, what is there? And if you look here, this is a great example of, he found me through LinkedIn. Something I really want to point out to you guys right now is up in this corner here, you'll see that art articles published by John. This is a new feature that LinkedIn is using. It's, they open, opened up their publishing platform, and now you can contribute content so that your first degree, your second degree, your third degree, and your followers see it. How valuable is that when you think about influence others? Those are all your brand advocates. Those are your employees. Those are your partners. So when you think about how valuable is that, super valuable. And as, as you look here, these are all articles that I want you to see. It's naturally, you're going on this path and you're learning more. And if you look, this C-suite objections to content marketing is something that that, that that client took to their CEO and said, here, this is what you're bitching about. Here's the solution. And it was a perfect it was a perfect example of how we got a client by basically looking at their path, seeing where they're going, and they read content that influenced them to make the decision to go with us. Humanizing your brand. This is something that's not new. Uh, it's been around for years. People say humanize your brand, but it's a lot more important these days because there's so many opportunities for your employees, for individuals and key employees in the company to get content out there. There's the LinkedIn's, there's all types of platforms. So you have to pay attention to this stuff. And uh, it's not just about you know, encouraging, it's also about doing it the right way. Ask yourself, is your company meaningful? So this is a big thing is that um, there was a study earlier this uh, year, it was called the brand index. Did anybody see this? No, meaningful brand index. It basically described that companies who cared about their, uh, their clients, their employees, outside of just selling to them, performed substantially higher about 120% above the top hedge funds out there. So just think about that. Then in the same study, it talked about how people uh, thought that only 20% of brands actually gave a shit about them. When you think about that, that, is, that hurts. 20% of brands actually care about their customers. They thought that this brand is just trying to sell to me. So think about that when there's a huge opportunity for a brand to differentiate themselves by actually adding value, getting them good information. Plated did that with me. They, they gave me the, uh, an article that basically helped me become a cook, but at the same time, it helped me become a client. Right here? Ship my pants, you're kidding. You can ship your pants right here. You hear that? I can ship my pants for free. Wow, I just may ship my pants. Yeah, ship your pants. Billy, you can ship your pants too. I can't wait to ship my pants, Dad. I just shipped my pants and it's very convenient. Very convenient. I just shipped my drawers. I just shipped my nighty. I just shipped my bed. If you can't find what you're looking for in store, we'll find it at Kmart.com right now and ship it to you for free. That had nothing to do with my presentation. No, I'm just, I'm just messing with you. No, it actually has a lot to do. So when you think about differentiating yourself, that was a form of video differentiation. And I want to tell you guys a story behind this. This is hearsay. I wasn't in the boardroom at Kmart, but this video didn't make it through at first. It got leaked. Did you guys hear about this? Okay, so it got leaked. Now, when you think about it, how great was that? Like, it was hilarious. I mean, I actually shipped my pants after that. Like, it was, it was like a form of pants, but I did. I actually did it, and there was Amazon. There was other pl places doing the same thing, but I, I thought it was hilarious, and it actually got me inside a Kmart uh, within two weeks, and I hadn't been in a Kmart in, in 10 years. So just think about that. And uh, when you look at it from the writing standpoint, you can do the same thing. So for me, when it comes to differentiating my company, I'm really big on treating people well. Partners, clients, we have a no asshole policy. If a client treats one of my employees like crap, I'll fire him. I don't give a shit. And uh, I'm really big on treating people with respect. Now, that's not new. If I went around and said, well, my key thing is we treat people with respect, you guys would be like, well, no shit. If you went around the opposite way and said we treat people bad, it wouldn't, I mean, it'd be dumb. So when you think about it, what's a way I can communicate that in a fun way that differentiates our brand? Well, we have the douchebag jar in our office. Um, the thought behind it is that if somebody says an asshole comment or a crappy comment, we will basically call you out for it and you have to put money in a jar. 
Now, with that money, we can either go to a happy hour, we can do something charitable, we can do something fun. But I wanted to make it open that it's okay. You can be transparent and call somebody out if they're being crappy, whether it be a client, a partner. You want to have meaningful relationships. So that was a great way to differentiate our brand. And my VP, where's Ryan at? Ryan's over here. Ryan mentioned that in an article or in an interview with us. When we were trying to get top talent, Ryan mentioned, hey, I read this article. It actually made me relate to the brand more. That's powerful. What's more valuable to me, getting 10 clients or getting an awesome employee like Ryan? So I didn't even think about it. Recruiting is huge when it comes to getting content out there. If you're going to be out there leading the way, having that example where Ryan says, I was drawn to you through this article and I felt closer to the company by reading that, I thought it was amazing. It was a surprise and we do it a lot more these days. So when you're creating this content, uh, one, it's got to be actual good quality content. So what make, how do you create it? Well, there's two things that go in for sure that you have to cover is that it has to be, one, actually expert stuff. If it's just fluff crap that you're just putting out there to get content out there, it's not going to accomplish your goal. So actually figure out a way how, that you can use your experts within your company to get that content, to actually have data behind it, to have experiences. Then at the same time, be authentic. One of the best examples that I've seen was two days ago. I don't know if you guys saw this post, but it was uh, from the Target CMO, and it was called The Truth Hurts. Did you guys see this? It was in LinkedIn. Amazing article, and it was so transparent about how Target has had a shitty six months, a really crappy six months. They don't have a CEO. They're having a lot of problems, and he wrote transparently as a CMO the challenges that he's going through, and it was so authentic. It went vi viral on LinkedIn, but it was a way where I, had, I felt closer to Target. I was like, man, I feel for you. I mean, that's, that's amazing. So think about how do you make it authentic? Personal stories, personal experiences, um, you know, doing things that you can actually relate to people. So think about that in the content. And then if you don't have any crazy you know, stories, you don't have um, you know, a differentiation factor, like one client came to us and said, we're the same company as this other. We pretty much do the same thing. How do I differentiate myself with content? Then you always have to look at what is valuable to the reader then, what's valuable to my audience. And you have to, that's the number one rule, that should be the test before any content gets out there is that, is this valuable? So here's an example of Zapier is a uh, really, really fun firm out of um, San Francisco. Now, they specialize in a productivity tool. So if he wrote like a Moby Dick type article that was like 3,000 words, do you think people are going to read it when they're focused on productivity? No, they're not going to read that. They want like Harry Potter. I mean, they want something that's actually very easily consumable, and they want it quick. So a lot of times people say that content is less quality because it has a number in it. In this case, it worked really well because it was actually what's valuable to, to his audience. Now, if it was something different where it was uh, you know, a data company where a white paper could have been a lot better, that, that's perfect. But in this case, Wade knew what was exactly valuable to his audience. This article got published on Dumb Little Man. Who's heard of Dumb Little Man here? No? Nobody? Yes. It went viral, went all over the place, reached his audience, and it was the best performing ar article that we had from him. And he was, in article, he was in things like Forbes, Inc. Think about that. It's where your audience is, and if you nailed it and you actually provided value to them, that's where the true value is, and that's where you're going to build your influence. So we've talked about where your audience is, running short on time, but um, one of the big things I want you guys to think about is how you can stay on top of their mind. Because influence is, isn't just initially influencing them, it's staying on top of their mind so that when they're ready to make a decision, they think of you. Or at the same time, when they run into somebody like, and they, that person says, why, I, I need a service like this, I need uh, you know, this solution. That person has recently saw something of you and they automatically think of you. And so think about doing that. Here's a good example of how you can do it in a, in a very, very thoughtful way. Now. <laughs> this is a painkiller versus vitamin scenario where if I came home, my wife would not say, hey, honey, there's a shark in the roof. We need to get it out. That's not how that conversation would go. It would say, honey, there's a fucking shark in the roof. I don't care how much money it costs. Get the, sh get the shark out of the roof. That's a pain, right? And if you look at the other picture, that's like a, oh, I'm painting every you know, couple, or I'm painting every year the same color. That's a vitamin. If she came home after I had a busy day and said, we're going to paint the house again, I'm going to say no, and it's, I don't care how much. We're not spending money on this. And so think about that with content. Here's a really good example of how our company did that with content. Four common pain points in content marketing. This was on our blog. 
we took these examples from clients where they said, hey, this is why we hired you. This is, the, this is why uh, we wanted to work with your company because we had this pain. So they identified it. There's a lot of times people don't look at my company as a pain. There's a lot of people here that they're not gonna look at your company as a pain. So how can you create that with the, the decision maker where you're not just creating something that doesn't exist, you're just educating them. So all we did was we took information from clients and we put it in an article which was common pain points. So when you think about it, it was very easy, it was natural, we weren't being promotional, but the, what we got from this article was incredible clients, they were educated, they wanted, I mean really they didn't care about money because they knew they had the pain. And so think about how you can create that. And then at the same time, here's the example of the C-suite. Um, you know, those of you guys who are in C-suite or you, you know, I heard, actually I just talked to someone, not gonna say her name, but I hear they say no, like CEOs and CMOs. I, like, I, this is a rumor that you actually have barriers up at the C-suite. Do you guys know that? You do, it's crazy. And so what I did here is I knew there was a barrier with me. So I wanted to get content out there that would actually educate, that would give them an asset so that they could take it to a, their C-suite and say, hey, here's an article. And it, it helped that person, when I was mapping out the roadmap of how they found us and what they did, it helped them sell our services. Gary's uh, speaking uh, later today and he, he'll probably cover this, but I did want to point out, when it comes to top of mind marketing, you've got to not just go and always try and sell, always try and be obvious with it. You've got to throw jabs. This is actually, ironically, I ran into Mike Tyson last night. I don't know how this happened, but ran into Mike Tyson. It's a lot shorter than I thought, but it was crazy. I knew I was speaking about this and using this example, and I just picture, just picture Mike Tyson going into the ring and just going like that. It'd be awkward first, but nobody goes into a ring and does right hook, right hook, uppercut, uppercut. It's awkward, you guys just saw it. It's really awkward. And so when you think about it, think about those jabs. Think about what you can provide where it's like, hey, how can we get information in front of them that educates? That is a good example where they can actually use it and feel like they're getting something of value. And then when you ask them to say, hey, it's ready for the right hook. You know, here's a sale that we had or here's you know, something that happened. They're, they're so educated, they're gonna be better clients, they're, they're gonna naturally trust you a lot more. So think about that. This is Gary's line here, but remember to throw the jabs before a knockout. So leveraging and distributing the content. This is something that a lot of people forget to do. Content is a beautiful, beautiful asset. And it's something that you can use in so many different ways. These are just four ways. I actually have a two hour presentation, which is long. It's all about this one slide. You can do so many different things, whether it's social media, using it in your social campaign. A lot of sales, I just spoke last week in sales about how you can use information coming from your leaders to use in your sales pipeline. So when somebody's trying to, when your salespeople are trying to get somebody to jump on board, they say, here's an article from our director or our CEO or from myself that I think you could get value out of. There's a lot of things you can do with it. I mean, SEO is the obvious one where you're showing up more on the web presence, but there's just a ton of things. Uh, recently, I just added it in my signature line where I have my recent post and I actually target who I'm sending it to. Like, uh, for example, if I'm sending it to somebody who I'm selling to, I'm gonna have something related to that, like why content marketing is a long-term commitment rather than a campaign, because I'm starting to prepare them. That's an easy way to leverage content, and there's a ton of ways you can do it. That's a plated example, so you can tell I jumped around quite a bit. All right, and building your influence, this is something I really want you guys to think about, is that too many people like self-declare themselves a thought leader. I don't declare myself a thought leader, that'd be a really stupid one, because then I'd be the thought leader of thought leadership, which would be really dumb. So, but think about that. It, declaring yourself a thought leader, declaring not true influence, that's a perception. So what, if you just focus on doing this the right way, building your influence um, in actually doing it right the first time, trust barriers are naturally gonna go down and you're gonna have a ton of benefits on, on the way. You're naturally gonna be looked at as that leader, as that authority. So just focus on building your true influence. There's a huge difference between 200,000 tw Twitter followers and 2,000. If there's engagement on the 2,000 and the 200,000 are all follow backs, it's not valuable. I'd, I'd pick that 2,000 Twitter follower every day if it's an engaged audience. So build real influence and don't just try and change your perception. Now this is the last thing I always end on. Um, I'm really, really, really big on helping others. I think that building your influence is a huge, it's a huge thing that you can do just every day just by helping people. So here's an uh, example that I, I try to do. 
or after every speech. Who here, like let's, rep let's take this, and this is a Starbucks gift card right now. Who here drinks coffee? Okay, actually I mixed that up. Who here doesn't drink coffee? Okay, raise your, well you gotta look at me. There you go. All right, who, who here drinks coffee again? Look around. You're trying to build influence in this room. What should you do with that? Wow, what a simple thing. We found out what was valuable to her, and he, it wasn't valuable to him, so he gave it to her. Such a beautiful way to build influence. There's two, it's, when I started the company, people would come, and I'd just take them on. I didn't care what they needed. I'm like, oh, in this spectrum? Yeah, bring it in. It really mattered, and it screwed us over. We took on the wrong clients. We didn't help them the right way, and it, it hurt our influence. It, it, we didn't build trust, and it hurt, it hurt the company overall. Now, we use that example every time. Are we the true fit for them? Are we the people that can actually provide this value? If we can't, we're going to find a partner who can. And there's just a ton of ways that you can help people out, but really think about how can I find out what's valuable to the clients or the partners or the people out there, and how can I help them get that value in the future? So just think about that. I'll leave on that note. Sorry for all the technical difficulties. I was actually a struggle, but you guys were really nice about it. So thanks.